Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Conversations with Coaches podcast. I'm your host, Kevin, and I've already got great energy from chatting for just a few minutes with uh, Stan Peak, one of my favorite returning guests. I have had a lot of those lately, I feel like, but I, I, I love all of my pod friends equally. They're all so wonderful. Stan and I had a fantastic conversation. Gosh, was that a year ago? I think that was almost a year ago at this point. You know what? I don't want to think about the past. <laughs> I'm 40 years old and we're moving forward. <laughs> and if, in case you don't remember, Stan is passionate about unlocking potential, one human and one business at a time. He's on a mission to help 1 million values-based leaders reach their potential with his coaching and his guidance. Stan, first of all, welcome back. I'm really glad to see you. Really glad to talk to you again today. So thanks for coming back on the pod. Kevin, thank you so much. Honor is all mine. Super enjoyed just chatting with you last time. Hopefully the audience got something out of it. I know I just loved hanging out with you and just, yeah, I feel like we could uh, chin wag all day. Yeah, that's as, as I so often half joke, half seriously reference. My one job is to keep an eye on the clock because <laughs> I could easily turn this into a, a marathon Tim Ferriss three and a half hour interview <laughs> style, <laughs> which, you know, maybe maybe that's a podcast down the road. <laughs> for which you'll be one of the first guests. But for today, there's one thing that you mentioned that, of course, like green lights, flags went up in my head as soon as you said it. You are working on a new book, which means I am certain you have a lot to say about that. And quite frankly, I want to know more about it. So tell me about what you're working on. Appreciate it. Well, you and I are both passionate about leadership. Obviously, it's why we do what we do. And the leadership and leadership development is kind of a table stakes for most coaching firms. They've got a leadership development program, organizations need it. But if you really dig into the research, leadership development programs are viewed as somewhat ineffectual. We spend the money, we get various results. Some people love it, but the decision makers, when they look at the bottom line, didn't move the needle. Did it move the needle on engagement? Did it move the needle on our culture? Did it move the needle on retention or even profit? And unfortunately, in far too many cases, the answer is no. So long way of guiding to the next book is I wanted to understand why not. I wanted to understand leadership development, uh, what we're teaching, how we're teaching it, why we're teaching it, and what we maybe should be changing. Uh, and I'll share one quick experience. I was speaking uh, last year to a group of maybe, I don't know, 40 or 50 uh, energy executives. <laughs> and we shared some research, which I'll come back to. And someone put their hand up and they like, it makes total sense what you're seeing. There's numbers behind it. But those skills that we should be teaching, would that not have been the case if you did your research 20 or 30 years ago? And that tells you right there, if the skills that we are supposed to be teaching, the skill gaps in the workforce haven't moved, then how mm -hmm. we're teaching it is not making a difference. It's it's really simple when you when you frame it correctly. It's just like every like uh, coaches know this in their bones. A well phrased question immediately yields the right answer to move forward with, and that's like it's basically you're you're framing things the way it's like. Look, if if this hasn't been working the way we've been doing it for 20, 30 plus years shall we consider that perhaps we could do it better? We could do it differently. <laughs> when you when you say it like that, it sounds so obvious, but we get stuck in our ruts, just like uh, everybody does. Uh, all sorts of reasons for this lack of self-awareness, institutional momentum, um, lack of commitment, lack of funds, lack of attention, all sorts of different reasons for this. But yeah, being stuck in a rut like that, it, I, I don't know if this is the right use of this phrase, but it begs the question, what could we be doing differently? Exactly. And it goes back to the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again, hoping for different results. Uh, mm -hmm. Before starting a, an executive coaching practice, I came via the world of uh, fitness coaching. And before that, uh, I was a football player mm -hmm. and played rugby. And it, typically, if you go back to when I played, and yes, it was almost the leather helmet days, there, was, there wasn't strength coaches that were supporting your team. I think in university we had one, but they're really junior high, high school. When I was lifting weights, it was your high school football coach that was showing you the same basic exercises that their coach showed them that are probably the same exercises that Joe and Ben Weeder uh, developed in the 1950s. <laughs> so there's just this recycling of here's how you do it with no thought to challenge what we're doing. And now you've got oh my gosh, you've got 
hockey players and football players taking ballet. And they do that okay. because it helps with obviously footwork and balance and coordination, which are pretty obvious that we would need those for sports. So if you get some of the more resilient, when I say resilient, I mean it not necessarily in the best way. Sometimes mm -hmm. that alpha male machismo sticks to things like deadlift and bench press and squat. And if they are now incorporating ballet, well, why are we not looking at leadership in the same sort of disruption and innovative or progressive mindset? Bad habits can be just as, if not more resilient than good ones. In fact, bad exactly. habits have a way of sticking. <laughs> Bingo. So the book, basically, long way of going there is it's uh, documented research by reaching out to executives from all over the world. So far, I think we've, uh, we're now uh, into 26 countries in terms of leaders we've interviewed, and uh, almost that many, I believe 23 countries in executive coaches we've reached out to. I wanted to understand the problem from two fronts, uh, the leaders and their experience and the coaches and what they feel would help make those leaders more successful based on their current practice or their years of experience. So we wanted to really have a very well-formed idea of leadership development best practices instead of recycling what we were taught and what our coach showed us. Very, I mean, uh, to the surprise of no one, very smart to make sure to look at both ends of that relationship. Because a lot of times you obviously will tend to, like people will tend to favor the perspective that most closely adheres to their personal experience or who they are, who, how they define themselves. But it's important when you're looking, when you're examining a relationship what and what passes between two entities or two people, whatever, however you want to define it. And, and again, it sounds obvious when you say it, it's important to look at both sides of that relationship. How both, how both sides are coming to the relationship, coming to the table, what they're exchanging, how they're exchanging it, in what ways, at what times, the words they're using, the, the constructs that they're, that they're applying, the analogies they lean to most, most readily, all sorts of stuff like that. And just, again, it's simple when you say it out loud like this, but yeah, you're looking at both sides and seeing how the overall relationship can be improved. It's almost like you're looking at three things. You're looking at the coach, you're looking at the leader, and you're looking at the relationship. Exactly. And we're looking at just the organization and helping them understand that uh, we are at a, a real crux of leadership transition. If we look at our generational cohorts, uh, by t well, by now, the research has been that by 2023, and you know, I don't know when this goes live, but here we are towards the end of January, 2023. And so this year, uh, I don't know exactly when, but at some point this year, there'll be a shift and more than 75% of the workforce in North America will be millennials or younger, which is great. I mean, that, yeah. that echoes population demographics. The challenge with that is almost everyone in the position of leadership is a baby boomer or even, sorry, a Gen Xer or even a baby boomer. So you've got this generation that is, you know, arrested, reticent to retire and there is not much of a transition or coaching or mentoring period with the generation that has to take over our military, our banks, our financial infrastructure, our schools, our hospitals, everything. We're not giving them runway of learning through the ranks. We're basically going to go, yeah, you know, I should have retired years ago. Here's the keys. Good luck. Which is, I mean, that's one way to delegate is the old scraping food off the plate method, which, you know. <laughs> Some people get hit in the head. Some stuff ends up on the floor. Generally, you just leave a mess. But hey, <laughs> it's off the right. plate, right? <laughs> exactly. There's food in the fridge. You're hungry. I haven't shown you how to cook, but good luck. It's, <laughs> this, is uh, really, this is a great subject. I, 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 think, I think about this a lot as I, as I myself am. I'm, I'm, I'm like late, mid to late period Gen Xer myself. And I've been thinking a lot, especially as I've kind of moved through my 40s, about intergenerational communication. And how how it's it's so slept on and so overlooked how not just important intrinsic to society it is in order that, that there that there be a way of not making yourself like previous generations or modeling yourself upon future generations, but being able to communicate the values of each generation and the meaningful connections of each generation in a way that doesn't obliterate or foster resentment or anything like that that actually translates lessons learned you know virtues established systems and processes that aren't 
worth throwing out. You know, not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. There are some things we've been doing for a while because they're tried, they're tested, and they're actually really smart. Now, we should try and test them again so that we understand the why. But there, there are certain things. And again, having that gen- intergenerational communication pathway established and really looked at and examined and invested in. And I, I want to hit that word again, invested in. That's where I think that's honestly, I think that's where your work comes right into a gap that quite frankly, we need as many bodies and as much attention as possible on this gap because that that communication is vital to where we want to go. A hundred percent. And read the book, don't read the book. I want to make sure we leave something actionable and uh, Hmm. usable for the audience. And I find that Gen Xers, particularly the coaches, but more importantly, the leaders that are Gen Xers, uh, well, at least up until this point, every population demographic from a leadership lens has had a defining challenge. You could look at wars, you could look at uh, droughts, you could look at recessions, uh, you know, obviously the dot com bubble burst, uh, mm-hmm. the the advent of the internet, all kinds of things, and the the generational challenge for Gen Xers like you and I is to be bridge builders. So we just talked about you know the up and coming generation and how they're not necessarily being mentored by the generation that came before us, and we are have the enviable or non enviable position of actually being what we call a kind of a rebound generation. The baby boomers were a very large uh, population demographic. The millennials are a very large population demographic. We are actually a smaller population demographic and we have to connect the generation before us to the generation after us. That will be, of course, every organization has its own unique challenges, but uh, societally, that will be the defining challenge for Gen Xers is how to transition those best practices, the culture, the history, the legacy, and bring in the innovation and connect old and young and leave the place better than we found it so that we set people up for success. Now, the millennials, they have a very different challenge and and likely it's still going to have legs from the pandemic the work from home. You didn't need the pandemic for the millennials to challenge the status quo of why do I need to be in an office to complete this work? So they may just be leading the disruption and innovation of truly work from anywhere, which I don't think has manifest to the degree it will. I think domestically, we have to look at our skill set and make sure it is valuable because if we were doing manual labor jobs in the United States, and all of a sudden we can figure out we can work from anywhere. Well, what's to stop employers from going not just outside of their home state, but to Bangladesh, to other places to get labor that can do same or similar job for a fraction of the direct cost. So a ton of challenges that the millennials will have to lead and manage. But before we get there, our job as Gen Xers will be to be bridge builders. Uh, which of course requires emotional intelligence, communication, coaching skills. You can already see how loaded this is, uh, but that's why I wanted to bring it up so that people can reflect, how am I getting ahead of this? I, I love this topic so much. It's something, honest, honestly, it's something I think about almost daily for, as, as I'm just like reflecting on what my role is personally in my, like, in, my, in my family, amongst my friends, in my professional life, in the world in which I live. And I do, I think a lot about being a bridge, being a bridge builder. And I think about bridge is an excellent analogy because bridges are, historically speaking, among some of the highest achievements of, of human beings, some of some of the most well, well-remembered, some of the most useful. Bridge building is crucial to culture building, society building. One thing to remember about bridges is they get walked on a lot. And you've got, you, if you're not, if you are not, you have to traffic in a lot of weight and you're going over some sometimes dangerous waters or some dangerous gaps. You have to be strong, you have to be ready, and you have to stand the test of time. And I feel like I, I, I like this analogy a lot. Like obviously, I think about this one a lot when it comes to it because I think that that emotional intelligence and that kind of proper resiliency is a requirement for for people like us, or at least in our age range, or anybody really who intends on being being or building a bridge. You got to be. You're going to be beautiful. You'll be. You'll, you'll be admired for the achievement and for the purpose you serve, and you're going to get walked on. <laughs> and criticized along the way. Does it make sense to build a bridge here? 
how much would that cost? I mean, use that analogy <laughs> any way you will. Oh, yeah. uh, you're, you're crazy on the way in. You're a genius <laughs> on the way out and not necessarily appreciated between those time horizons. <laughs> but leadership is not uh, something we undertake for credit. Obviously, we do it because we see a cause, a purpose, um, a mm -hmm. better future that we are committed to. And true leadership is not standing by idly in the face of a problem we're not okay with. Yeah, it's not so much where do I serve, it's how can I be of service. And if and for for us, that looks like something different than it looks like for different generations, both older and younger. And if you ask the right question, it's just like, it's not where do I do my work, it's how do I do my work best? And so you exactly. change the question and you start getting different, better, more forward moving answers. And then comes the courage and then comes the commitment to actually pursue those answers to the next questions that are going to be asked for you and for the people who come after you. It's, it's, uh, some would call it a virtuous cycle. Some might call it a vicious cycle. I think it could be either one or both at the same time. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and the opportunities to serve, as you put it, are all around us. Uh, mm -hmm. It could be so simple. My son plays hockey and there's a lot of volunteer roles. Every game, someone has to step up and work the clock or, you know, the score sheet or the penalty box and range in ease because we're all parent volunteers. You know, we don't do that for a living. We're coaches, accountants, lawyers, doctors, whatever we do during the day. And it, it's easy or easier not to do it, but it requires a leader to step up and just fill a void when there's work to be done and no one doing it. And organizationally, that's all around us. It's way easier to complain that we're not progressive. We're not doing this. Stuff doesn't get done around here. That's easy. Doing the work without being asked or without being thanked or without understanding how it's going to directly affect your compensation this week, that requires faith. That requires leadership. I love I love that you, you mentioned that you're in hockey because I think I, I'm a huge fan and I, I think about it a lot. Up, up a podcaster that I think you've been on this podcast before, Michael Pacheco. He was, he's played semi-pro hockey throughout his years. He loves it as well. And I frequently in this, in this context, I think about the hockey assist, the past that leads to the past that leads to the goal and how I love that in hockey. That's really one of the, one of the few sports that has that so elevated and institutionalized. Like you, you get credit for the past that leads to the past that leads to the goal. And obviously there's the past that leads to the past that leads to the past down and down and down and down. You get all five, you get all five people on it. It leads to something the team is celebrates. I, I've always really loved that soccer has that too a little bit where it's like you get so much, you get institutional and organizational attention and admiration for the, being a connector for not just not necessarily being the spark or being the fire at the finish, but being, being the circuit that connects the two or being a part of that circuit. And I think, I don't know. I, I, I think about that a lot. And I think about how leaders are everywhere. There are gaps to move into everywhere and everyone who chooses to do that is a leader I, i'm, I'm you with go. you i love hockey is such, yeah you still got me i still got you, you. Still yeah I, I lost you for about okay, seven perfect. seconds we'll we'll chip it out oh, okay <laughs> i was saying i couldn't agree more hockey is one of those sports that's analogous to business because you know leading and lagging kpis any mm. company wants more revenue more profit but that's not a a, a strategy that's an outcome so that's mm -hmm. a lagging KPI. The leading KPI might be sales pipeline, sales meetings, reach outs, whatever the case may be. Hockey is the same way. As, of course, we want to score more goals than their team. But how do we do that? How many shots on goal have we taken? And even an individual's uh, plus minus rating. Do good mm. things happen when Kevin's on the ice? Do we score more goals or get scored on more often? It is such a fitting analogy if we think about business is, what levers can we control? We know what the goalposts are. We know what we're trying to accomplish, but how do we get there? How do we, our input activities lead to the greater likelihood of better outcomes? Because that's what we can control. Man, yeah, to the surprise of no one, I'm just kind of like, okay, can we talk, can we do sports analogies and bridge building for another three hours? Because this, this is my, this is like my meat and potatoes. I love this, but it's, and time flew. It's already been almost 25 minutes we've been chatting. So I will give you a chance to, does your book have a name or is it still, is it still in the formulation phase? We're just going back and forth with that with the publisher. So depending on the turnaround time here, I will leave it as a bit of a tease uh, because we're down to <laughs> two potential titles and I don't want to say the wrong one. So I'll make sure that in follow-up, I give you that. So in the show notes, 
we have the title and we should be moving to publication pretty darn quick. I do expect it's a decent turnaround time. So very much appreciated. And again, I didn't come on here just to say pump the book. Really, I look at every one of these conversations as first and foremost, a chance to connect with someone I respect and admire. And second of all, a chance to just share wisdom because I learned so much when I was starting my coaching practice from listening to podcasts just like this one and from other coaches. Why not? I mean, we live in the age of information. You can shrink your learning curve by listening to great conversations, hopefully this being one that serves others. I think so. I, 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 knowing our audience, I feel like this is going to be, it's going to be real juicy stuff. Just, just like we both got really excited and animated when we started talking. I think it'll be the same for the listeners too. And also rather than letting me know what the title of the book is, obviously it's going to go on your website. I presume you're probably going to put it up on LinkedIn. So I'll just make sure that I tease that the title is down to two. And if you want to know the final title, go to you know, Stan Peak, LinkedIn, or do you have a website that you like to direct people to yet? Or Yeah, getsuccessfaster.com. And if they go there, then all of our coaches' bios are there. We actually hmm. have grown to, I think, 34 coaches now. And my, it'll be getsuccessfaster.com slash Stan Peak. Uh, hmm. But again, I'll include that in the show notes to send to you so that people can know exactly where to go to purchase the book or I love to make sure I share free content as well. I, I hate it when someone is only in sales mode all the time. It's 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 okay to profit from your work. It's in fact yes. a requirement of the work continuing and to just find ways to serve, just to find ways to give, to to open 100%. doors. Yeah. So Stan, this has been great. I'm totally going to slide into your DMs on LinkedIn and invite you back in a few months, maybe maybe like spring, early summer. Did, do you have a release date for the book? I forgot to ask that totally. Is it it's going to be 2023 probably? Yes, definitely 2023. And I'm earmarking that it'll probably be three months. In my experience, stuff can go wrong. So let's push it out to less than six months. So I would nice. say that we're at this point looking at a summer 2023 release. I'm going to have to have you back on then. We'll talk, we'll talk about the book as fact. <laughs> well, put it this way. I don't know if I have a standing invite, but you've got a standing yes to accept. I'll come back on the show anytime you're happy to have me. Ah, that's what I love to hear. All right. I should let you go as our time is about to about to run out. Stan, thank you so much for coming back and talking to me. I had, I had a blast. <laughs> as did I. Thank you, my friend. And to the audience, you know what's out there. Listen to our previous episode. Listen to this one. Look for that book title coming very, very soon to a link in the show notes near you. And we'll talk to you again here real soon. 